you, you can use the podium or you can walk around as you like. Oh, thanks. Honor to be here. Hello everyone, friends, especially those friends who are online watching this uh, program. Uh, I have been given the topic which is green economy for rural prosperity or shared prosperity. Uh, so my big three ideas are number one, why we need green economy, why we need what we need. I mean green economy, what is the rationale? Second, if we want to achieve green economy or elements of green economy, uh, what are the building blocks where we have to focus? And I will talk about indirect drivers of change. And finally, if we really want to achieve green economy, what are the indicators and especially the compass of the measurement of progress and welfare where we uh, need some attention. So, um, I'm not going to give a definition of green economy, but uh, to share some story. I mean, basically, the development paradigm or economic science says that uh, uh, elements of natural capital or natural resources, they are the part of production and consumption. So that means their relative worth or scarcity values would be reflected through the pricing or the cost. And uh, people will be using them as per their relative value. That means, that also means alternatively that you pay for something, you get something. If you don't get something, you don't pay for it. Uh, that has not happened. If you see the broad pictures of last 30, 35 years. Three broad macroeconomic aggregates. GDP, for example. GDP has gone up by eight to nine times in purchasing power terms during 1980 to 2013. So eight times. Investment, it has gone by nine times. I'm not giving you the big, big numbers, just broad trend. So GDP going up during 1980 to 2013 by eight times, uh, investment by eight times, trade in terms of volume by seven times. Of course, population, the number of homo sapiens has also gone up. In 1980, we were around 4.4 billion. Now we are around 7 billion plus. So in terms of per head trade, volume and per head GDP, uh, we have gone ahead and uh, uh, we have made a good progress. But the same, if you see the natural capital or ecosystem services, it has gone down. Around for the same period, uh, ecosystem services has gone down. That's what Millennium Ecosystem Assessment said that 60% for the same period, ecosystem services has declined. Uh, we are pumping 33 billion tons of carbon. We don't have uh, a kind of list of endangered species on a uh, coherent yardstick, but this endangered species list is increasing in every assessment for the same period if you take for every five years. That means that there is something wrong somewhere, that the kind of natural capital which is feeding the development process and the growth is not being recognized. So this integration, this mainstreaming, is one of the corner stone of the green economy effort. Story number two, we are talking about the climate change. As you know, the assessment has come out and then there are some literatures and the assessment coming from individual scientists from all over the world that out of uh, 7 billion people, top 3, top 3 billion in terms of income, they are responsible for 50% of emission, 50% by top 3. And bottom 3 billion, 5%. Out of that 3 billion, 1.3, as uh, has been mentioned, they don't have even access to basic fossil fuels. And uh, 
out of that 1.3 billion, less than 800 million, they are living the life of pre-industrial you know, revolution. All of us will be affected by the impact of climate change, that's true, but tragically, those 1.3 billion people or, or 3 billion people who are in the uh, uh, lower bracket of income, they will be affected more than anyone else because they are more vulnerable, they are poor, they don't have the safeguard, you know, a standard in their, you know, scheme. So how to bring those 1.3 billion people in the energy security net that is one of the goals of the green economy approach. Let me tell you one more thing. Out of this 1.3 billion people, if you take around 400 million people, uh, the poorest rock bottom, they are the chronic poor. The chronic poor means a person is born as a poor, he, uh, he, he lives his entire life as a poor, and when he dies, he passes the poverty to his kids. Now, these are the guys, it's a challenging problem how to pull them up and bring and give them a respectable life and that is also one of the goals of the green economy um, now the the issue is what should be the optimal level of of economic activities as a with respect to the total natural system where you have a decent life for a large number of population and certainly those who are uh, uh, underprivileged is, is another goal of the green economy. Now I will tell you another you know, a story. We are talking about the trade-offs. Food security and ecosystem services are one of the celebrated trade-offs. I mean, in many parts of the world, especially in South Asia, Amazonia, Sub-Saharan Africa, where lots of poor people, you need food, right? So the way the Green Revolution has brought, uh, uh, you know, food security, or at least the kind of food they are producing, this has caused also soil salinity, water logging, monocropping. And the challenge is we need food, but how to produce food where uh, ecosystem services or resilience of natural capital is not, you know, compromised. I will give you the example from the place where I come, from India. Uh, Andhra Pradesh is one of the provinces of India. It is, it has around 4.4 million people. In terms of size, it could be like Lebanon or, you know, Oregon State here. Uh, they also followed the green revolutions. In the 80s, uh, they started using intensive farming. That means more reliance on chemical fertilizers, one or two crops, more use of pesticides and insecticides, and so much so that 35% to 40% of inputs cost was only on chemical fertilizer and pesticides. Of course, the terms of trade uh, was not in favor of agriculture. Agricultural productivity started declining in the 90s. Of course, farmers who 82% are the marginal farmers. So those farmers started borrowing money, of course, from the local uh, you know, lenders or the local banks who used to charge them astronomical interest rate. So by the time of 2002, 75% farmers were under debt, under severe stress and depression, and the phenomena of suicides started happening in that state. And it became very alarming. There are lots of media reports about that. Some local organizations and NGOs and uh, opinion makers, they realized that no, we have to do something about it. And what they started doing, that they changed the cropping pattern, they threw some botanical formulations, they started avoiding use of pesticides and chemical fertilizers, and then agriculture was on track, not only it enhanced productivity, but the farmers 
we are not required to take loans and not to suffer all the consequences which they were going through earlier. And today, uh, in the last four to five years, 300,000 are following the organic farming. It's a successful story. And the more farmers are in process, and other states in India and South Asia, they are planning to follow them. And that was another story, how the trade-offs can be resolved in a way that it secures the future of farmers in terms of income and jobs. At the same time, it does not compromise the resilience or the health of the nature or agricultural ecosystems in the state. And these are the success story. These are the trade-offs and the pathways to resolve them is one of the backbone of the green economy approach. Um, and that's why in a world of growing population, needs, aspiration, high consumption, stress, ecosystems, and climate. Uh, we need to follow economics, align the wheels of development and conservation in a way that it gives a respectable life to people. It has ability to provide and a good livelihood to the poorest of the poor. That is also one of the backbone and elements of the green economy. Now, idea number two, identify, acknowledge, and demonstrate the missing links for robust intervention and the response policies. Now, when we talk about ecosystems, natural capital, we always talk about habitat fragmentation or, in, or introduction of new species. We talk about climate change. That is true. They are the big drivers. But the indirect drivers in terms of governance, costing, pricing, are somewhere else. And people, sometimes they understand, but they are not able to link the two. The examples are plenty. I mean, export of aquaculture from Bangladesh, for example, or Vietnam, uh, causing damage to mangrove or the coastal pollution. Uh, similarly, export of pineapple coming from one part uh, in northeast India causing soil erosion, topsoil. And the example could be many, like you know, uh, export of beef causing deforestation. There are enough data. How to, how to bring these indirect linkages into the discourse of policy formulations? How to capture those costs? how to capture those benefits and reflect them to the cost and benefits wherever they are. Sim similarly, uh, we talk about uh, mm, uh, you know, governance, we talk about uh, institutions. They are also important part of the indirect driver. So indirect drivers are something which are, again, uh, uh, in, in, in uh, 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 the ambit of the tools and approaches which green economy is trying to recommend. Uh, of course, the rule of the game, investment, uh, saving behaviors, devaluations, exchange rate policies, they have impact on natural capital. Individual researchers here and there, they have documented it. But somehow, policymakers, they have not been able to understand or at least embrace those linkages. And that has caused a disharmony or a kind of disjunct between the practice of policy and the conservation goals. We need to bring them uh, uh, on the common table, these two sides. There's another thing, when we uh, so we, the green economy, also tries to deconstruct the micro happening. Sometimes a very sweeping statement is given, a macro. When we talk about, for example, poor and the ecosystem, for example, uh, there are views that, okay, Incidence of poverty causes degradations. Then some other guys come, no, 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 no. Uh, degraded ecosystem causes incidence of poverty. Third comes, no. Correlation is spurious. 
It is a market failure, information failure, government failure, which causes the poverty. Some other guys comes, say no. It is the induction of perverse policy which is causing the poverty and degradation of ecosystem both. Macro trend can mask the micro reality. And the poverty and ecosystem dynamics needs to be understood in the local context. And in, the, in order to understand the local context, the dependence, the cultural practices, the social, psychological, and other institutional, we have to understand only then a meaningful policy can be designed. That is another aspect or element of green economy. Now, third thing which I would give the name like uh, rectifying the compass of measurement of progress, including GDP. GDP, which is, I mean, I don't need to talk, and people in this room, I'm sure, might be knowing a lot. GDP, the gross domestic product, which is, uh, roughly speaking, or uh, is equated with the income. Now, income is very good measurement. It shows, I mean, if there is a half percent decline, there is a human cry in the parliament, in the government, that we are under recession. Uh, but the way GDP is calculated, it's probably not good to say anything about the dur duration and direction of human welfare. And in fact, whether it was in US by Ruggles and Ruggles, in 50s and in Britain by James Mead and others, they never tried to say that GDP should be taken as a proxy of welfare. But by some historical mistakes or some coincidence, it came to be taken as a proxy for the welfare. And uh, it has several problems. I won't go into that. Like, you know, the bad defensive expenditure, they are part of income, which should not be. Uh, you cut the forest, that goes to your income, but where forest goes? I mean, it's if, if, if income is based on the double bookkeeping system, so your credit, my debit, my debit, your credit, and you cut the forest, forest is gone, but you build the house and your income has gone up and your income, everything looks good. That is bad economics. Uh, also, no way, just one more illustration, no way GDP can be taken as a measure of welfare, which many studies have shown. One simple calculation. Suppose the GDP of a nation grows by 2% per annum. 2% per annum. 1,000 years after, what will be the uh, income? If it's a simple geometric progression it will be around 400 million times of what? So if GDP now is one, after 1,000 years, it will be 400 million times. Can you imagine human welfare increasing by 400 million times? So somewhere, this correlation between GDP and welfare is either lost or there is something wrong somewhere. So we have to think about it. I will come back to the forestry part, because that is the, the point of discussion here. Uh, under new program called Vantage, Valuation and Accounting of Natural Capital for Green Economy, we have done some estimates. And to share with you, again, living in Kenya and giving the examples, in Uganda, in the national income, forestry contributes 20%. In Iran, the national income, forestry contributes 20%, but they are just the log, wood, and timber. If you talk about other ecosystem services, they are missing, and that constitute 80% of that 20% which is being accounted. So that 80% is absolutely missing. S similarly, for Kenya, 35% comes from forestry, again, log, wood, mostly to some extent, some NTFP or uh, non-wood forest products, and 65% of that 30% is missing. 
The sad part is that those missing are the income which goes directly to the poorest of the poor. And that part is missing. So GDP of the poor is absolutely missing. Finally, uh, in Zambia, the forestry contributes 6% and it provides 1 million jobs to the rural poor in Zambia. Now, half of them are not recorded. This is our own estimates. Uh, finally, in Central Republic of Africa, the bush meat, which, is, which meets, uh, which is around 1% of GDP roughly, they are missing in the calculation, and they meet the need of the people, the protein needs of half population. So these are some of the missing links and missing contributions which need to be captured. And that's why, as a final remark, in terms of uh, green economy, what it, it can do to enhance the rural prosperity and shared prosperity, prosperity for everyone. Number one, make nature's contribution and its values visible everywhere. Second, change the incentive structures by changing the set of options available to people, to all the actors, from household to the national policy makers, through market-based instruments. Third, ecosystem or ecological infrastructure should be part of planning everywhere, including the ecosystem-based adaptation to climate change. Natural capital can be a very good, uh, very uh, handy in alleviating poverty. Mainstreaming of nature should be done across sectors, across actors, and of course, across discipline. We have to think about new indicators. We talk about, we know the problem with the GDP. Why can't we think about uh, inclusive wealth where you have human capital, natural capital, uh, and the produced capital? Ken Arrow and Parthadas Gopta and many others have been saying for the last five decades, per capita wealth, measure, wealth measurement gives you a better proxy for the progress of the system. And that's why uh, this new program under Green Economy called Vantage tries to do all those things, Vantage Valuation and Accounting of Natural Capital for the Green Economy, uh, uh, led by uh, UNEP. I will stop here.